It is my pleasure to introduce our speaker this week. Uh, he's uh, Pierre Menard. Uh, he did his PhD uh, at the University of Toulouse with uh, Aurélie and Larivier and Gilles Stoltz. Um, and he's doing a postdoc right now at INRIA Lille, uh, working with Emily Kaufman and Michal Vaco. And it turns out that he's moving soon uh, to Germany to work with Alexandra Carpentier. So Pierre has been working a lot on bandits, asymptotic optimality and bandits, uh, simultaneous uh, asymptotic optimality and uh, finite time optimality, these sort of things. Uh, and lately he's been getting into reinforcement learning as well, or well, it's sort of, we had a little debate as to whether this counts as reinforcement learning or not. Uh, but I suggest that uh, Pierre takes over and explains his work on adaptive reward free exploration. Please welcome Pierre. Thank you. So uh, thanks for the introduction and the invitation. So, uh, in this talk, I will present our paper, uh, Adaptive Reward Free Exploration, and some other recent work related to it. And um, it is a joint work with Emily Kaufman, Omar Darwish Dominguez, Anders Johnson, Edouard Laurent, and Michel Valco. Okay, so, um, um, so in large parts of the literature, like the goal of an agent is to maximize the cumulative reward. So uh, currently to minimize the cumulative regret. And like one close notion to it is like the PAC MDP one when uh, the agent is asked to most of the time play an epsilon optimal policy. And uh, so it's like one advantage of these two criteria is that there is no separation between the learning phase and the exploitation phase. So uh, this is interesting if you want to learn continuously, but because of this uh, well-known exploitation exploration dilemma, you cannot be too aggressive with respect to the exploration. And so in, in contrary, in this talk, we will consider like something different, which is like the pure exploration um, setting where we only ask the agent to learn an optimal policy. So there will be two distinct phases here, the learning phase, where there is only exploration and then exploitation. So uh, this, uh, this setting is interesting because uh, like in pure exploration, we don't care about the performance of the agent during the learning. And we only care ab about the performance of the policy returned by the agent. So it's, sometimes it's what we really want when you uh, try to learn a policy rather than minimizing the cumulative regret, for example. And, um, and for example, you can um, completely imagine that in this setting, the agent will play at some point a very suboptimal policy, uh, provided that this policy will uh, give like uh, um, um, leads to a big improvement in terms of information. So uh, this setting is well studied uh, when the oracle uh, that the agent has access is a generative model. Generative model, I mean by that, that the agent can sample all the tradition everywhere for all the state action in the MDP. Uh, so this is a reasonable assumption in some settings, for example, when you have game, but in this talk, we will consider a more complicated setting um, and more general, which is a fold one model where you can only sample trajectories. And in particular, we will consider two pure exploration settings uh, so the um, best policy identification when we, um, so which is the most natural one when we ask the agent to learn directly the, an optimal policy by interacting with the uh, uh, MDP and the reward fee exploration setting. Uh, when the agent is asked to uh, first learn the transition kernel, uh, no matter what is the reward function, and then to deduce from this um, learn kernel by planning an optimal policy for any reward function. So it's a more indirect way to learn an optimal policy. We first learn what we don't know the transition kernel, and then we plan to get the optimal policy given a, re a certain reward function. Um, okay, so like the, uh, pr like the, um, uh, the talk will be articulated um, with two main parts, which is like the first one, the best policy, we will present the best policy identification setting, which is historically the first one introduced, and then we will move to the reward-free exploration. Uh, so uh, like we, this will be our assumption, we will consider an episodic MDP, so that we fix horizon H, 
uh, we will consider uh, like that the everything is finite, so a tabular MDP, like the state space and action space. And most importantly, we will consider like non-stationary transitions. So this is the uh, more general uh, assumptions than when we have only transi stationary transition, and we will see it in the, we will pay it in fact in the, um, in the bond. And this uh, transition kernel is the only thing unknown by the agent because we will assume that we have deterministic reward and uh, that the agent known the, uh, the reward. Um, and yes, by a trajectory, like uh, when I described like the Oracle, I mean um, that we have a fixed initial state, so we can relax this to, uh, to have like uh, an initial state sample from a certain fixed distribution, but it's, it's kind of equivalent to this uh, uh, assumption. And uh, so as usual, given the state, the agent has to choose the action here. And um, then uh, you can observe a new state and get the reward uh, that, um, uh, that corresponds to the state in the action state. Okay, and like given a policy by uh, like, like because of the with the, thanks to the Bernoulli equation, we can define the Q value function and the value function, and we denote in particular by QFH of pi, like the uh, Q value function of state action S A, and same thing for the value function of state S will be like V H of pi. And uh, with the optimal Bernoulli equation, this time you can define an optimal policy. Um, so this is uh, okay for this is for the notation and now so we present the best policy identification setting. So uh, here the goal, so I uh, recall the goal is like to explore to actively explore the MDP to find an optimal policy by star. So uh, here we don't care about like uh, the performance of the policy used to collect the data. Uh, the only thing which is important here is to learn as fast as possible the optimal policy. So uh, the exact formulation is the following. It's due to feature. It's like for any episode T, uh, the agent will se uh, select a certain policy pay, uh, by T based on the past observation. And then this policy ex is executed in the MDP and we observe the associated trajectory. And at some point, the agent can decide to stop uh, because uh, he thinks that he gather enough uh, information and uh, predict what you think is the optimal policy. So here it's p time. And thus we have a general structure for a, a best policy identification algorithm. It's made of three different rules. Uh, the sampling rule, which is like uh, the policy used to collect the data uh, by interacting with the MDP and collecting trajectories. The stopping rule, so this is a stopping time, so which is very important. Um, it's a random variable, it's, and it's a time when the agent decides to do the prediction and the prediction rule, which will, will be here, a policy. And, uh, sorry, we will not consider all the algorithm, uh, we will consider only a certain class, which is like the epsilon delta pack algorithm for BPI. So what is an epsilon delta pack algorithm? It's when with, uh, for all MDP, with probability at least one, one minus delta, um, the um, predicted policy is epsilon close to the optimal one. That is, its value at the initial state is epsilon close to the optimal value. Uh, so this is the class of uh, algorithms that we will consider. And uh, now our objective is that given this constraint on the algorithm, we, what we want to minimize is, as I said before, we want to, to learn the, the optimal policy as fast as possible, as fast as possible. So we want to uh, minimize the sample complexity, which is, will be two here, the number of episodes used in the learning phase. And um, one natural question is like, what's the order of this, uh, this sample complexity? How hard is this uh, setting? And like for that, we can start to look at the lower at a lower bound. So uh, we can prove this um, uh, worst case lower bound, which says that like for all epsilon delta pack algorithm, and um, there exists an hard MDP uh, for this specific algorithm where you we can lower bound the um, uh, sorry the uh, um, um, 
expectation of the sample complexity uh, tau. So given this constraint on epsilon and delta for the algorithm, we, uh, it's like not uh, surprising to have this scaling in epsilon and delta. And like, uh, for example, you can check that if epsilon goes to zero or delta goes to zero, like your sample complexity needs to be, uh, like goes to infinity. But we will, uh, what we uh, will interest us, it will be like the dependence with the horizon and the different uh, quantities that characterize the MDP. Here it's like the, the uh, size of the state space and the, the size of the action space. And I will rather like uh, decompose like these terms in two, in two terms. The first one is H squared, it's in fact due to the range of the value function. And the second term is the number of different solution probability that we as uh, the agents need to learn. So in particular, we have an extra H here because we consider, uh, sorry, non-stationary um, uh, transition. Uh, so, uh, like, if you have only the, uh, if you have the, ass the stronger assumption that the MDP is stationary, then you will get an H square and not an H cube in the dependence. Uh, so, how we prove that? So, uh, as usual, like for a worst case bone, we will find, we will build a class of hard MDPs. So, for example, um, imagine that, like, the, the, like, to simplify, uh, the number of states is fixed, it's equals to four. Uh, we will consider this class of hard MDP. So uh, you have an, an initial state here, a, a waiting state, or rather, where you can choose either to stay or go down at state S1. And when we are, you are in state S1, you can either reach a bad state or a good state. In the bad state, you have zero reward, in the good state, you have reward one until the end. And like for all the action in the state S1, uh, you have already one half to go in the by state or in the good state, except for one action, we have a slightly larger probability to go uh, in, the, um, um, in the good state. And you can see that like the optimal policy uh, for this MDP will be to choose the right step to go in, the st in, uh, in state S1. And in this state S1, there will, uh, at the right step, there will be one action optimal. So you, you just take it and you will have a slightly, slightly larger policy to go in the good state. So this construction is in fact equivalent to a bounded problem with HA arms. Uh, and uh, we, where the distribution of the arm are scale Bernoulli distribution. So you have H here, and like, so it's because you can stay uh, roughly each step in the good step. And uh, is, here, this uh, Bernoulli, uh, like it's the slide, you have a slightly larger to, um, to have a good uh, uh, large reward if you uh, take, like, so the, to go down, if you go down in, step, in state S1 at the right step and choose the right action. And um, you, uh, you can have the same construction for any um, um, uh, number of states. It's kind of uh, exactly the same construction. You keep this waiting state uh, at the beginning, and then you build a tree of uh, approximately, uh, with a size of approximately S, and with, uh, like in, in particular, S leaf. So here it's in uh, yellow. And each leaf you have, uh, you will have A action, and uh, each action can lead you to this good state or bad state with, uh, with probability one half, except for one leaf. And in this leaf, there is one action that leads you to uh, the good state, but this is true only for uh, one step. So you will have to choose the right step to go down in the tree. And in the tree, you have to choose the right uh, state. And in the state, you have to choose the right action to be optimal. So this construction is also equivalent to a body problem with this time HSA arms. And the distribution of the arm is also a scale Bernoulli. That's why that's uh, using classical uh, analysis, uh, proof, uh, technical um, um, uh, proof in bandits, you can get this scaling in H square, so this is the scaling of the distribution, and here's the number of arms, which is H uh, S A. 
Okay, so uh, we have this lower bound, uh, and now the question is like, what, can we reach it? And so we will consider several algorithms, and uh, um, we will only consider a model-based algorithm. Uh, uh, sorry, Pierre, can I stop you for a second? Yes, yes. So like, uh, regarding this lower bound, I guess I sort of missed like what was non-stationary about it. So this uh, is this stationary yeah. MVP, no? Here you have. Uh, it's like because your transition depends on the state uh, in your MDP H. Mm -hmm. um, but in, but in this particular it's... example, where does this show up? Here, in the, in, at the initial state, in, in this waiting state, you have to choose like at which step you will go in the, in a state S1. For all H dif uh, different at this uh, H star, you will have a uniform probability to, to go in the bad one or the good one except for one H. So somehow you have to choose when you will be in the state S1. And, and because of this choice, it's uh -huh. kind of like a multiplication of the number of, of arm by H. I see, I see. So basically like H is part of the state and that influences the reward. I mean, the way this is how I read this MDP. Uh, yes, like this distribution in blue, you only have at, at the H equals to H star. Oh, I see, I see, gotcha. Okay. Otherwise, you can, you, it's uniform. And it's the same construction here, so it's a bit more involved because you have a kind of I see. Uh, shift because you have to go down in the tree, but uh, uh, when you start to go down, you fixed when you will be in one leaf because like, the size of the, of the tree is fixed. Okay, okay, perfect. Got it. That's all you get this extra factor H because of the non stationarity. So, that right, <laughs> you see that we pay it there. Uh, yes, great. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so, I will continue. So, um, um, Okay, so I will add, so yes, I will only consider model based algorithm, which because in fact uh, it turns out that the optimal algorithm could be model based. And for the model, it could be always the same, it will be the empirical MDP. So it's exactly the same thing as the initial MDP, except that uh, uh, um, instead of the true kernel transition, I will use the empirical kernel transition. So you the empirical transition are defined like that, so it's uh, morally uh, like the proportion of visit um, of the state. And uh, so it's important to keep in mind this notation, so this NHTSA will be like the number of visit of states action SA at step H uh, at episode T. And I will add a at uh, for all the notations that are linked to this, uh, that that are all the quantities that are computed in this uh, empirical MDP. So in particular, sorry, uh, the, uh, like the value function of, uh, of the policy pi in the empirical MDP at episode T would be this V at uh, HT pi. And same thing, like the optimal policy in the empirical op, um, MDP uh, would be this P at star. Okay, now I will present uh, the, the, what we named the RFUCRL algorithm. So it's an adaptation of a very old algorithm proposed initially by uh, Fitcher in 94. Um, also for the best policy notification setting, but for um, discounted setting. And we also s slightly change uh, the way we build, uh, we, um, we do optimism, um, and uh, mostly we uh, we um, provide a new analysis of the algo this algorithm. So uh, this algorithm is based on three main ideas. Uh, first, is that like if you know that you uh, you can estimate well all the value function of all the policy, then you you know that the empirical optimal policy will be close to optimal. So uh, precisely, for all policy pi, in, uh, if you compute the value function at the initial state of this policy in the empirical MDP, and it's close to the true value function, so at most by epsilon over two, then you know that the uh, empirical optimal policy 
uh, will be epsilon close uh, to the uh, true optimal policy in terms of value function at the initial state. Uh, and then what we will do is that we will build upper confidence bound on this left term here. Uh, or rather, we will build upper confidence bounds for all the um, estimation and the error of the Q value function at any state action um, uh, well, where we estimated uh, in the empirical MDP. So it's this Q hat. So um, let's say we have this uh, upper confidence bounds, so this E bar. T pi, and like for the um, sampling rule, we will just use the policy that maximize this upper confidence bounds on the error um, uh, at the initial state. So we greedily reduce the error by playing the one that maximize it. Um, well, so how do we build first like this upper confidence bound on the error? So it's very simple, in fact. Uh, we just decompose the error in two terms. So uh, you can decompose the error in a first term here where uh, you, uh, you have the error due to the estimation of the probability transition uh, at state action SA. And then uh, the second term, it's the error of estimation of the transition probability at the next step. Uh, so we, and what is important to note here is that the error are propagated through the empirical transition probability and not the, 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 the true one. And then what we do for the first time, we just use, for example, Hofding inequality. So we have this uh, scaling in H square because of the value function, which, which is between zero and H, and we pay the usual square root of uh, 1 over n, so I recall that nht of sa, it's the number of visits of state action sa, and we have some exploration bonu uh, bonus function here, beta. Okay, then it's easy to build an upper confidence bound for uh, for this error by just upper bounding like the next error by this the same quanti quantity, so we define it recursively, uh, and we just clip it, uh, clip everything to h because we know that the error is between 0 and and because of this of the inequality, we can uh, like be larger than this. Um, and then what is interesting to note is, is that like the um, uh, policies that greedily reduce the upper confidence bound on the error at the initial state is, is in fact the policy which is greedy with some maximal error upper confidence bound, so this E bar, so there is no dependence in the policy anymore which are defined like that, where we just replace the policy pi here by, um, by the maximum. So you can see this quantity as a kind of uh, Bell, optimal Bellman equation counterpart for the uh, optimistic, uh, like the upper bound on the error. And this will be like rather the uh, Bellman equation. And uh, what is very important to note is that all this quantity can be computed by the agent. Like you can compute this E bar because you know everything, you know the empirical transition, and uh, you know the bonus because you choose it. So we have everything to define the RFUCL algorithm. So for the sampling rule, we just so, uh, be greedy with this uh, uh, kind of maximal upper bound. And for the stopping rule, we just stop when this upper bound at the initial state it's smaller than epsilon over two. So this is B. Okay, great. Uh, uh, okay, so I don't know where you lost me because, uh, yeah, I can't see you. So. We've seen uh, this one and also the construction of the confidence bound. Yeah. Yeah. So this is a confidence bound. Yeah, we've seen this. Yeah. We you see okay. the time programming stuff. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so, yeah, so, like, yeah, this one. Yeah. I can start here. So uh, yeah, that sounds good. Um, then yes, it's exactly uh, so. The sampling rule it's just what I described before. So it's this greedy policy with respect to this uh, maximal upper confidence bound, and uh, for the stopping rule, yes, well, so it's what I was saying. You, uh, we stop when we the error it's smaller than uh, um, our upper confidence bound on the error at the initial state is smaller than epsilon over two. Uh, 
uh, what I wanted to say is because of this, because we will we can guarantee this inequality if we have the uh, uh, the, the condition of the um, uh, stopping rule is met, and we know in this case that the uh, empirical optimal policy it's epsilon optimal, so we can just recommend this uh, policy. Uh, so this is the prediction rule. And so, uh, can, I, can I quickly ask a question? Yes. Or maybe maybe it should be after you explain something. But how does this work in bandits? Uh, what do you mean by in uh, what well, does this work? a threshold case, right? So let's uh, put h to be equal to one, s is equal to one, a is the number of arms, and I know you're in a bandit. And like, what the heck does this algorithm do in bandit? Uh, in bandit, you only uh, you um, uh, you will build only uh, like uh, upper confidence band, but only the exploration part, so the square root of one over n, and you will pull them. So it will be very close to uniform, in fact, uh, to sampling uniformly the arm. Yeah, it will be uniform, right? That's yes, uh, like up to this, uh, like. Uh, 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 yeah, you will be tracking uniform distribution, yes. Yeah. So shall we think about that as a clever algorithm in Bennett? Uh, if you want to estimate the mean of the arm uniformly, yes. I mean, like, if you don't know the reverse, then yes. But maybe if you know something about the reverse, maybe. Yeah. I mean, we will present it after. I will, uh, yes, I will say something about this after. But yeah, yes, if you definitely, if you know the reward, you should use it. Yes. Yeah, I was just uh, like really puzzled by this whole thing. Okay, good. Okay, but yes, like in bandits, it will be the uniform. Um, okay, uh, then so we can prove uh, this uh, sample complexity bound. So. Uh, so first, like this algorithm, it's epsilon delta pack for best policy identification. Um, so it's a simple consequence of the stopping rule. And uh, the sample complexity is this thing. And uh, we see that like we are loose to one uh, with one factor H uh, from the lower bound. And we also have this additional uh, factor S. So the factor, the additional factor H is because of the Hofding inequality, which is not very like the most uh, the tightest inequality uh, concentration inequality. And uh, this S is because of the choice of the uh, exploration bonuses here. And yes, uh, so what is very important to note is like this algorithm never use uh, the rewards. And that's why we name it so reward free. Uh, so for RF, it stands for reward free. And UCRL is because we kind of build the uh, bonuses in the same way as the UCRL algorithm. Um, uh, can I ask a question about this? Yes. So is this just UCRL then? Uh, no, 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 because we, uh, it's like just like the way we construct the bonus. But it's not uh, UCRL because we don't use the reward. No, I mean, uh, like yeah. if you run UCRL, but you set all the rewards observed to zero, uh, and and you say that like I'm certain that those the correct rewards or whatnot, what would UCRL do? Um, Same. Yes, maybe. Yeah. I I suspect it's not quite the same, but like, is is it substantially different? And would you see a be a reason? No, I think right? it will be very close. But it depends how you uh, how you do. Because uh, if for UCRL you you used like confidence la bond build with like I don't know uh, with KL bonuses, then uh, you will have zero everywhere if you put reward equals to zero everywhere. Uh, except at the like uh, the time when you will reach the end of the MDP. Yeah, it's not, it will not be the case. Maybe you mean just the observed rewards will be zero. And uh, sorry, what was that? I mean, if you just mean that the observed rewards are going to be zero, but you still have a confidence bound rewards, maybe it will be similar. But I don't know. I will have to look at it more carefully. I mean, the general philosophy is very similar, right? So. 
Yeah, yeah so, I think what's different here is like the use of the absolute values in the definition of these right. uh, E's and these value functions. You see, other with like no absolute value, you would scale those with yeah. the value function of the future. So I guess it, it's it, 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 it is even true that like whatever version of UCRA you would take, it wouldn't quite solve this problem because it becomes increasingly confident about that there are no rewards or like the rewards have some simple structure, whatever you do with it, like unless you do something exactly like this. So that is somehow a need to modify UCRA, right? Uh, in fact, we will yeah, like, see. Yeah, UCRR is an algorithm you can always run. Why not? Right? Um, but just after, we will see that an algorithm very close to UCRL is, in fact, good in this setting, too. But <laughs> it will use very well. Uh, uh, that will be a slightly different setting where you have the reward. Yeah. Uh, but it, it will like, uh, leverage the knowledge of the reward. This algorithm does not do that. But it's still it's still a, a reasonable algorithm for this setting. Right? You have like uh, uh, a bond, okay. and you can prove that it's epsilon delta pack. All right. Okay. I wait. Um, okay. So yes. So then, well, yes. So it's strange that we do not use the reward in this setting because we assume that the agent knows them. So. Um, so what we can do to use uh, like the rewards. So one idea is to use a regret minimizer algorithm uh, for the sampling rule and an upper bound on the simple regrets for the stopping rule. So uh, as I present, as uh, we discussed, just discussed, like you can build confidence region for the transition probability. Thanks to this confidence region, you can build, uh, construct upper, upper confidence bound and lower confidence bound on the Q value and uh, the value. Uh, like you can do that by optimistic dynamic programming. And then uh, you, we just have to choose the stopping rule. And for that, you just like um, consider that we have this uh, confidence interval on the optimal value function at the initial state here. Uh, and sorry, and uh, we just compute it with, so it will be like the, the difference between the upper bound and the lower bound. And when this thing is smaller than epsilon, then we know that uh, because uh, on the left we have an upper bound on the optimal value function, so it's V star. And on the right, uh, because the way we construct, uh, we, we do optimism here, we know that the lower bound on the optimal value function is also a uh, lower bound on the value of the policy that is greedy for the lower bound. So this P tile here. And thus, we just have an upper bound, so for free, on the gap of this policy. And we can just stop when this is smaller than epsilon, because we know that this policy that we can compute, it's, it's epsilon optimal. So this policy p tile. So the algorithm is just that. You uh, run, as your sampling rule, you use your uh, regret minimizer algorithm. So you choose the argmax of the um, upper bound on the Q value function for the stopping rule. You just look at the width of your confidence interval around the value function at the initial state. And for the prediction, you return the, um, uh, the um, uh, policy which is greedy with respect to the lower bound. And choosing the same exploration bonus, you can prove that this algorithm has a sample complexity. So like with high probability, so the same as uh, RFUCRL, but like with a tighter analysis, like with the usual tool, which are like to shave a factor H, which are the Bellman equation for the variance and uh, Bernstein inequality. You can shave uh, for this algorithm <coughs> an extra factor S here because of the way you build the bonuses. Um, and we can see in practice that like using the, re the reward is very important, uh, which is like not so surprising. <clears throat> For example, if you consider this double chain MDP, so you have a chain and only a reward on the right side. And uh, here we plot uh, the expectation of uh, the, um, the sample complexity, so the stopping time too. For the RF UCRL algorithm and the BPI UCRL algorithm, so the ones that use the reward. And you see that like you will stop much earlier with this BPI UCRL algorithm. Um, 
Yes, because you expect that RFUCRL will be will explore like symmetrically uh, both chain of this MDP, uh, both sides sorry of this MDP because like it don't use uh, does not use the reward the knowledge of the reward except and uh, in contrary, BPI UCRL algorithm will only explore on the right side. And, I mean, uh, sorry. Wait, but so symmetry cannot just explain this difference because it's orders of magnitude more. So it's not a factor of two, right? Um, yes, but it's not clear that you really pay a factor of two here. I mean, like you pay more, right? Like that, that's what I mean. Like if you're not using the reward, somehow you're paying more than a factor of two. Like based on your explanation, it seemed to me that like the difference between the two algorithms is going to be that one of them explores the, the reward sensitive one explores to the right more and kind of starts to ignore the left ones, but like it's a little bit more complicated than that. I think that the reward sensitive like really goes and like explores the vicinity of the reward more often and like focuses much more and much faster than the other one. The other one like makes sure that like all the transition probabilities are equally precisely estimated everywhere because like who knows where the reward is going to be and it will be really important to know all the transition yes. probabilities <coughs> very precisely. To be, to be completely precise, like uh, yeah, it's, it's one reason, but yes, uh, like, like the, the one using the reward will only explore along an optimal trajectory. Uh, so. yeah. Like you focus your uh, your exploration there, and the algo other algorithm we explore all potentially uh, optimal trajectories. Yeah, and so yes, that's why that's have yeah. a factor of two. Yes, it's more than a factor of two. The reward is like yes, yeah, 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 but, yeah, yeah. Okay, sure. But uh, I mean that we use this specific construction like to uh, just like uh, uh, show uh, like the different behavior of the two algorithms. Sure, 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 makes sense. Um, and okay, and so we are still lose by uh, so we are still have a factor H to win, so uh, uh, sorry, an additive factor S to win here, and this uh, it's like it's, you can just be more aggressive with this uh, exploration function beta, and just withdraw the factor S here. Uh, so what is important is that like this confidence region will not exist like it will not hold anymore but we are still able to build confidence bond uh, on the q value function and the value function so uh, we can keep the, the regret minimizer as something rule but for the stopping rule we, we mu must do something different because we cannot guarantee anymore that this lower bound the optimal value at the initial state will be also a lower bound for the policy which is greedy with uh, like the lower bound the q value so we have to build by hand uh, an upper confidence bond on the simple regret. Uh, this is in fact and computable by the agent, but we, we can do that in fact. And uh, we just stop when this is smaller than epsilon because we know that the policy plate is uh, op epsilon optimal. So it's very close to the previous one, except that we change the expression function and some of the stopping rule. And for this algorithm, you can prove that uh, given that epsilon is small enough, uh, that the, this algorithm, B, what was that we named BPI uh, UCBVI, is um, it matches the lower bound. So we can uh, also shave this extra S factor. Can I ask a question about this? Yes. So what happens if that the sampling rule uses this really aggressive bonus, right? And for the upper confidence bond, you're going to use a more conservative bond. But since that really focuses more on just like some specific class in the MVP, so to say, uh, you can still win. Is that how it works? Like, well, you use the same beta for both the upper confidence? Yeah, yes, for both. For both, yes. Uh, I don't oh. know if you. Oh, Sorry. OK. OK. So maybe maybe you can okay I I don't exactly know how you do this it seems magic uh, like if you had a fixed value function uh, which you don't have then okay that extra s wouldn't be missed but uh, if you don't have that then 
Okay. Um, I'd be curious to learn more about this maybe later. Um, like the uh, so the algorithm is really uh, like uh, like you build confidence bond, but with this more aggressive uh, exploration bonus, which in fact you concentrate not all for all possible um, like the empirical transition uh, like the empirical uh, transition probability uh, for all possible function, but only for the optimal one. So and you so you can do that and. Uh, what is interesting is it's you can also build a kind of upper confidence bond on the uh, simple regret. Yeah, that, uh, that's that's the thing that I didn't get, like how that is possible. The other one, like I, it's it's in fact you just look at the analysis of uh, like a regret algorithm, and at some point you can just say, okay, this will be my uh, upper confidence bond on the simple regret. Uh, okay. It's, maybe it's not so clear, but uh, but it's not totally uh, uh, um, like okay because it's we we still need that epsilon is small enough. Otherwise, we cannot do it. Uh, we we still need this condition. So there is a little okay. trick. So the, the trick is that if epsilon is so small, then your value function is so close to the optimal value function that the extra term becomes lower order or something. Uh, this I don't know. Like, what I can say is that, like in the analysis, uh, we have uh, we still have a dependence in S, but for the lower order term, and we can kill this lower order term by taking epsilon small enough. Okay, and uh, so yes, to recap, we have so we have this three algorithm, and uh, for like for the we have this BPI UCR algorithm that kind of interpolate between the two, and the first one. Which is interesting is that, like for RF UCRL, we do not have to know the reward, but like in the counterpart, is that we pay it in the sample complexity. And with a more aggressive uh, exploration function, we can like match the lower bound. And now we uh, will move to the reward for exploration. So uh, if you remember, like at the beginning, I said, like the only thing which is unknown is the transition kernel. And in fact, if we know the transition kernel, then we know the optimal policy. Uh, so uh, we just need to learn the transition kernel to get an optimal policy. Uh, but uh, like to learn the transition kernel, we don't need the reward. Like uh, it will be strange to, uh, that we need the reward to learn the transition kernel. So here we can see it in two phases. Like we will first uh, learn the transition kernel. So now the goal is to, and then we will have for free the optimal policy. So the goal is to actively learn the transition kernel. So, and uh, for the moment in this learning phase, we uh, we assume that the rewards are not fixed. And uh, we can say, uh, like, well, we we first need to choose uh, what loss we will use, uh, knowing that the adjunct will return a uh, uh, guess for the transition kernel, which will be this p time. So, like, first uh, first guess will be okay. We can lose the log loss. Uh, so, which will be some uh, something like this uh, av uh, weighted uh, average of Kullback Leibler divergence for each transition, uh, but like it's not clear at all how to choose this weight. And in fact, what we really want is that our, our transition kernel, our estimated transition kernel, is good for estimating value function. As, so we want that for any reward and any policy, like the value computed with uh, our uh, predicting transition kernel, so this v tied here, uh, is close to the value of uh, any policy uh, computed in the true MDP, uh, like with the true transition kernel, and this for any reward. So we take the maximum of all the possible reward and all the possible policy. And we can take and we can say, oh, this is the loss for uh, predicting p tied. Okay, but what we uh, like really care about is like the optimal finding the optimal policy at the end. So um, we will rather take as the loss this uh, quantity, which is uh, uh, very close to the previous one. So we, we will consider the gap uh, of the uh, policy, the optimal policy, but this optimal policy will be computed in the MDP uh, wh where we replace the transition kernel uh, by the estimated one. 
and we will consider the maximum of, over all the reward function of uh, this uh, gap of the of this predicted policy. So, um, in particular, this policy will depend on R because, like, we will change the reward function, uh, and so uh, it's uh, it's in the MDP where the reward function is R. Oh. Uh, okay, so this will be uh, the, the loss that we will consider for uh, reward-free expression. So now we are ready to uh, define clearly the reward-free expression setting uh, introduced by uh, Ginata. So uh, it's very close to the best policy identification, except that like, for, no, for the moment the, re the rewards are not fixed. And for each episode T, we uh, also uh, consider um, uh, policy PyT based on the past observation. We execute this policy and get a trajectory. So, and and at some point, we will not um, um, predict a policy, but a transition kernel. And the structure of an algorithm for uh, reward-free expression, it's almost the same. Uh, so we have a, a sampling rule, which is like the policy that we use to collect the data, and a stopping rule, which is the time when we decide to predict uh, the uh, transition kernel, which would be this p type. Uh, and again, we will consider uh, epsilon uh, delta pack algorithm, but this time for reward free exploration. So, uh, what we mean by that is that for all possible transition kernel, uh, p, with probability um, at least one minus delta, um, for all the reward, like the uh, policy. Um, uh, the optimal policy computed in the MDP, where the reward is like the one we consider, and the transition kernel is the predicted one, then we know that this policy is epsilon close to the uh, optimal one in the true MDP, so with the true transition kernel. So this will be the cons our constraint, and what we what we want to do now is to learn as quick as possible, not the, uh, like uh, as before the uh, optimal policy, but first the transition kernel. And uh, so uh, we can uh, go back to our RFQCR algorithm because this algorithm does not use the rewards. But additionally, uh, because of its stopping rule, we know that for all the rewards and all the policy, uh, the, um, this like the predicted uh, like the, the policy computed in the empirical MDP uh, when we uh, fix uh, some reward will be epsilon optimal. So this holds, in fact, for all policy and all reward. So we do not need to uh, modify the algorithm at all, except for the prediction rule here. Uh, um, we will return not the empirical um, optimal policy, but the empirical transition kernel. And we keep the same stopping rule and the same sampling rule. And so, uh, uh, as before, like for this choice of the expression function, we have the same uh, sample uh, complexity uh, bound. But this time, the lower bound is not the same. The first things important to note is like if you have uh, an algorithm that is epsilon delta pack for reward free exploration, then this algorithm will be epsilon delta pack for also best policy identification because you just need to return the optimal policy. Uh, computed with uh, like the um, empirical transition, like the, the transition kernel predicted by the algorithm. So the lower bound for best policy identification holds also. But uh, the uh, additional uh, S factors that we tried to uh, shave uh, before for best policy identification, it's here. In fact, uh, Ginata proved that in the small epsilon regime, we have to pay a S square factor and uh, when the delta is fixed. Okay, and uh, I will sketch the proof of the sample complexity. Um, for the, um, like the fact that it's epsilon delta pack, simple consequence of the stopping rule. And the sample complexity, the proof, it's very simple, in fact. Uh, if you do not stop at some time t, so you know that this condition is not met, so you know that you have uh, this upper confidence bound that is larger than epsilon over two, then if you remember this upper confidence bound, it's just like you propagate uh, these bonuses. Uh, so here, pH uh, t by t plus one is a rich probability in the empirical MDP of, um, of the state action SA at step H under the policy p uh, by t plus, t plus one. 
And uh, with constant Trojan argument, you can say this quantity is very close to the true one, so with the true transition kernel. So you end up with this, uh, uh, this inequality. Then you can sum it over all the t uh, before uh, the stopping time tau, because you know that the condition, the stopping condition is not met. And then you recover something very close to what uh, appears in the, in, the, in the usual required bounds. And you know that, uh, like, uh, proceeding uh, as in, the, in this proof, um, you, um, you can upper bound this term by some, some square root of, so the initial h square, the bonus exploration, and h a of 2. And then you have to sum this for all the step h. So here it's like the fact that the MDP is non stationary. And so at the end, you pay, uh, you, uh, you have an extra h square factor. And so you have a functional inequality, inequality on this uh, stopping time uh, tau, and you just need to solve it to get the bond on the sample complexity. So this proof is in fact very close to the uh, uh, proof on the regret bond for the, for regret. Sorry. Um, okay, and we can see uh, like what is like the number of uh, visits in this uh, double chain MDP for. Or, or RFU CRL algorithm. So we compare it with the two Oracle in this setting, which are a generative model and uh, the BPI algorithms that use the facts, the knowledge of the reward. And uh, like as computer, we, con we consider the random policy. So we see that first that the, with the random policy, it's very hard to uh, reach the edge of this MDP. Uh, and uh, so it can be very harmful if the rewards are there. But it's not the case for the RFQC RL. So in green here, we still manage to reach the end of the uh, this chain. And uh, we can see, uh, so as we mentioned before, there's an algorithm that you, uh, you use the, like, the knowledge of the reward. Here, will more focus on the right side rather than on the left side, which is not interesting in this case. And we did also on a simple reward, where you have a reward one at the bottom right here. So uh, for the optimal policy, uh, you should, in fact, only explore uh, this part here in red. And we see that like RFUCRL managed to explore uh, well all this uh, grid, uh, contrary to the random policy, which is kind of stuck at the initial state. And uh, OK, like to finish, uh, we will try to shape this dependence uh, in the horizon. So. Uh, in fact, what we can do for that, it's like we will build like this quantity, uh, WT, except that we will not use the usual bonus in uh, of uh, one uh, square root over n, but rather one over n, where n is the number of visits. So we can define this recursively as the RFUCL algorithm. And then we are just, uh, we just take the policy which are greedy with this, uh, with this quantity. And uh, we can prove that, in fact, this, uh, uh, this will lead to an optimal algorithm um, which will match the lower bound to polylog term. So it's not clear at all how we can analyze this algorithm because we do not use like the usual bonus. So uh, it's not clear. And uh, because usually, like to shave this extra factor H, like the two main tools is to use bench salt bonuses and a Bellman equation for the variance. But in fact, we don't know the reward here, so we don't we were not able to compute uh, like uh, at least the empirical variance. So uh, what we will do is we uh, rather use the Bellman equation for the variance to construct the bonuses, and not only in the analysis. And like because of that, we can build an upper confidence bound on the error at the initial state with this W. So it's it's with uh, this inequality in red. Um, so here we have two important remarks. It's like, first, we only control the error at the initial state and not at all these states as in uh, RFU serial algorithm. And, but we use bonus of, uh, um, of order one over n, but it's not in contradiction with the usual uh, square root of one over n reduction of the error, because here we have, uh, we have this square root of the, the, um, this quantity w at the initial state. Okay, so um, like for the algorithm, it's very close to a RFUC algorithm, except that uh, we change a bit the stopping rule, and we still return the empirical um, uh, transition kernel. And so for the same bonuses, we are able to match the lower one. 
and shave this extra factor H. And uh, to get more intuition on it, um, um, like we can ask like what this ex uh, algorithm is actually optimizing. So for that, you just consider like the distribution of a trajectory under a certain policy pi and the transition kernel p. And the same thing, but when the transition kernel is the empirical one. So you can compute the callback labor diversion between these two uh, distributions, so the distribution of trajectory. So thanks to the chain rule on the left here, uh, you can decompose this callback labor divergence as a weighted sum of the callback labor divergence of the transition probability. And uh, thanks to Pinsker inequality, you know that if you control this uh, quantity, you control also like your error estimation. And in fact, wh what this uh, what is this W uh, quantity? It's an upper bound. It's, we can see it as an upper bound on the callback labor divergence between this, uh, the distribution of these two trajectories, because we have a natural uh, upper bound on uh, this callback labor divergence which scale in one over n. And it's exactly what is used to define this W uh, up to a scaling factor of one over h square. And so, like uh, we can see that our policy, in fact, greedily reduces this upper confidence bound because with dynamic programming, we can relate it uh, like to this uh, the WT, uh, so without the pi uh, defined before. And this explains uh, like the, the way like the why we choose bonuses in one over n, so it's because it's a natural upper bound of the kullback labor divergence. Yeah. And so, like, like to conclude, here uh, we are, uh, we saw that like this um, uh, very old algorithm uh, presented by Fisher is in fact like uh, efficient in the, like which um, initially is like made for the best policy notification setting. It's uh, almost optimal in the um, uh, reward-free setting, and uh, we and for both setting we provide like. Um, algorithms that match the lower bound up to polylogarithmic poly term. And uh, as open question, uh, maybe we should rather look now on uh, problem dependent bound and algorithm because uh, I think like minimax uh, um, bonds that like uh, we look at like for the moment uh, kind of hide a lot of things. And uh, uh, there is like several work already on this, uh, on this problem, but not so much. And another um, interesting problem would be to get the, an optimal algorithm for best policy notification when epsilon is la it's large, like not uh, smaller than something in one over s. And uh, I will stop there. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. All right, thank you. And we are still more advanced. Oh, wow. I can see a lot of fans as well. <laughs> yeah, so we had a bunch of uh, questions in the chat. Um, Kishan had a question. Uh, Kishan, do you want to ask your question about pessimistic versus optimistic choice? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, so. This was uh, initially, I think it's in the slide 13. Um, yeah. So there are two types of policies, right? A sampling policy is optimistic uh, in the sense it is using the upper bound, uh, and the uh, prediction policy, which is using the lower bound. So that's why I'm calling it as the pessimistic policy. So uh, you mean this one? Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, correct, correct. Yeah, this one. So, yes, yes. So, and pi tilde, which is the prediction rule, uh, is the op uh, epsilon optimal policy, right? Uh, so, I was just thinking if uh, the sampling rule is also an epsilon optimal policy. <laughs> like, I might be wrong, but yeah, this uh, said some like. Um... So, Peter, the question is if yes. I prediction rule to use q upper bar rather than q lower bar would the result change in a substantial way or not um like we we uh, initially tried but uh, we figured out like it was not necessarily uh, 
but so it was easier to prove it with the the one that is greedy with the lower bound. Um, I'm not. Um, I think it's it may be possible also to prove it with the one which is greedy with the upper bound since we like uh, we know that. The, but uh, I'm not completely sure. I need to like uh, think about it. Yeah, I was thinking it's like an epsilon two epsilon difference or something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's not it's possible that you have to pay this. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, in fact, like, here it's a bit arbitrary. We just choose that because, like, it's very simple to prove it. Yeah. Uh, I think right. there is no like uh, fundamental difference between the two. And if that works, anything works. No. Wow. Sorry. Somehow, like then, if 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 that would work, like with Q upper bar and Q lower bar also works, then anything any any Q functions that are in between should also give you the choice, right? Uh, absolutely no. Well, you, yes. Uh, so They're all more. close to the truth, right? Uh, in some way. Um, yes. Um. Yes, maybe, yes. Mm. All right, I don't know whether Christos uh, made it back. Um, he had a question a while ago, but we can also save that like for the off record thing and then we can wait for him to come back. Uh, he was uh, putting down his kid to sleep, I think. <laughs> Getting quite late there. So, so I had a question regarding these bonuses and stuff. Like, I understand that the bonuses that you end up adding is of the order one over n, and you provided some justification for it. But uh, I sort of missed like the intuition as to like why can you actually do this? Like, why can you mm -hmm. or like so aggressively in this setting, or like collapse the interval mm -hmm. so fast? Like the intuition, it's like uh, somehow we are doing the same as RFUCRL, but inside the square root. Mm -hmm. And because at some point we want to use uh, like the Bellman equation for the variance and win this factor H. So we have to push every, everything inside the square root. And we, uh, we are greedy inside that. Like, uh, but my intuition on this problem is that we are greedily reduced like this this um, kullback labor divergence between trajectory. And uh, so we will have a good estimate in like for every trajectory in the um, uh, in the empirical MDP, we will know that it will be close to a trajectory in the true MDP. So, and then after it's very easy to do planning because of this, uh, this um, property. So I, so I just sort of wonder why can you not do this for say, Cumulative regret minimization as well. Uh, I just use the same confidence bands. Uh, well, like f first, like one uh, technical reason is that like here we are controlling the transition probability, so if, uh, you will at least lose a factor s here if you want to do that for regret, because we need uh, control of uh, the transition uh, probability in KL or in norm one or as you want, but you will lose a factor S because you don't want to have this for all the trajectory uh, in for regret. You want to have this only mm -hmm. along the optimal one. Right, yeah, sure, sure. Uh, yeah, I get that. I, I'm just wondering if this would like work at all for uh, for regret minimization. This is what, I, what I'm sort of not seeing. <sighs> Uh, all these bonuses are like vanishing like very very fast and you just sort of give up exploring too early you just zone in too early to yeah i don't know maybe maybe there's something that i'm that i'm missing uh, i don't know but first we will need like uh, at least to use like the, the reward somewhere um and um mm -hmm. It's not clear if, like, uh, we will see appear this bonus in one over n so uh, 
so easily. Uh, I don't know. I um, see. Yeah. Okay, well, I think I'm gonna I'm gonna need to take a look at the details here. This looks very technical. By the way, did did you try to implement this RF express target them and then? Uh, yes, yes. In fact, it's very close to uh, the RFQCRL one. There is almost no difference between the two in the MDP uh, that we present. It goes like if you go uh, here, it's a bit more flat than RFQCRL uh, for the green curve. It means wow. that you. Uh, flat in the sense that you will uh, have more, um, uh, you will sample more the extremity. Oh. Mm -hmm. It's just, but it's very close. So it's maybe it's, it's not prevalent like this observation. Uh, but the behavior is very close. Right. I guess maybe the the answer to Gary's question is that somehow this ergotone works by balancing out exploration. And for this, maybe it doesn't matter that much whether you think they're the square roots or not. But it, it is still a bit mysterious. I agree. Um, Uh, the okay. thing is that with bonus in one over n, I think it's like, not possible to prove on any upper bound on, on the Q value, for example. Uh, yeah. Thus, yeah. I, I think it will be like then very hard to apply optimism. Uh, yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Gotcha. So, so yeah. here in this blog. Sorry, Chavo, go ahead. No, it, it's more like the idea is tracked like where the big adders are and like propagate the adders. Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. That works too. Yeah. So I'm just looking at this figure on the right and I'm just wondering what would just plain UCRL do here? Uh, how, how would that visit the states? Uh, it's, it's, it's close to what is in red, like the BPI UCRL. Right, right. yeah. So yeah, it, it visit more like the right side mm -hmm. as expected. Mm -hmm. It still goes on the left because you need to explore. And mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it's like similar to the optimal policy, but shifted a bit. I don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, right. Yeah, yeah. Gotcha. So I see that Christos is back. Uh, I don't know, maybe, maybe we can like. Uh, go off record and he can ask his question <laughs> if it's controversial. In